Yes. Then the nominee, then the witnesses. Let me see if I have the witness list there. Are you sure? I do. Thank you. I just want to say, before we get to a lot of Murphy, uh, 
Councilman Drew felt he's tied up. He should be here momentarily, and then he will take over. Uh, Next, we'll hear from Paul Adam Murray. Good to see you. Good to see you, Councilor. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of Federal Management this morning as a colleague. Uh, we've been working together for the past nine years at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, and there are some, in these nine years, I've noticed some attributes. Um, they have been correct me about that. He is thoughtful, he's precise, he's thorough. And he has always applied the law with absolute integrity. Um, and these traits, combined with a real sense of equity and fairness, enabled him to reach some resolutions for us in some very, very gnarly matters. I'll give you just one example. Um, when Michael first came to the department, it was at the very beginning of the Great Recession. And as the economic crisis worsened, he saw a real exponential increase in the number of homeless so much so that we had to use motels as a last resort shelters. At one point, the department sued, um, and the sued over the rules that were put in place uh, for the residents to protect the health and safety of the residents in motels. And as chief litigator for the department, Michael negotiated over a period of many months uh, its close communications with the other secretary and myself and other staff members. Uh, to reach an agreement that basically restructured the uh, shelter residency regulation. And throughout those negotiations, we searched for ways to make life in a very difficult situation <coughs> easier. But he never ever lost sight of the necessity of protecting all families, especially the children of the women and girls. Partly, Michael and I are working very closely together on the efforts to protect the residents of properties where the affordable housing restrictions are expiring. To become an expert in the administration of a very complicated process that's dictated by the legislation. And in this effort, he has always had a difficult sense of that And in full time, I'll just say that hat is probably one of the two words that best describe Michael. Hat and intellect. And those are two very negative attributes, I would say, typically in a judge. Thank you for your consideration, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Madam, Mark, before we hear from you, uh, if you want to introduce any uh, family members or any of your friends. Thank you. Uh, my wife, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Milch, no one is here, and uh, I really appreciate her support throughout the process. And I have colleagues here from my current work, Chris G., from where I work in the Legal Foundation, Maria Caradavitas, and I'm very honored that Lynn Munster and uh, Judge Shin from the Appeals Court are here. Uh, I work together closely with Judge Shin at the Attorney General's Office and with Lynn Munster at Mass. Thank you very much. And now we'll uh, hear from you. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm honored to be here today before this esteemed body, the Governor's Council, which plays such an important role in the governance of our Commonwealth as envisioned by John Adams and our state constitution. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you, the governor's counselors, for your time, your consideration, and your advice on the process. I would also like to thank the witnesses who have come here today on my behalf, my mentor and former supervisor, the Honorable Andrew Granger, and my colleague from the Department of Housing and Community Development, Alon Murphy. I want to acknowledge a few people who have been here before. <coughs> been here before. I'm so grateful that they're here. Uh, in my remarks today, I'm hoping to provide you with some insight into my background and motivations that may not have come through in the black letter of my resume, but that I believe suit me to being an impartial and compassionate judge. I first became interested in the law because of family stories about my maternal grandfather, Lou Mallon. He was an immigrant who came to America speaking no English. He and his family pushed tourist carts on the Atlantic City boardwalk. He worked his way through college and law school and then worked as a prosecutor during Prohibition and the Depression when his reputation for honesty and integrity put his life at risk. He set high standards for himself and therefore set high goals for his children and grandchildren to match. My grandfather was not my only role model. I've been blessed to 
my legal career with more experienced lawyers and judges who imparted their wisdom helped me to grow as a practitioner. My first litigation experiences were with the clinical program at Cambridge and Somerville Legal Services. Then, as a young lawyer at Boston Housing Authority, I honed my litigation skills, trying cases in front of Judge Baer and Judge Winnick in the Boston Housing Court. Working in an understaffed public law office, I learned through trial by fire. The issues were pressing, the needs great, and the case were large. We were still dealing with the vexing problem of desegregating public housing. I was grateful that I could play a role in that important struggle. At BHA, I became a passionate advocate for fair housing, affordable housing, and just plain more housing. It's so important in New England for growth and economic development. I jumped at the opportunity to develop my intellectual understanding of land use law as an appellate advocate for New England Legal Foundation. At NELF, I often represented small property owners trying to provide affordable market rate housing for working families, and for large developers striving to ensure that Chapter 40B remained an effective tool for building much needed subsidized housing. This background helped me to understand the Fifth Amendment's regulatory takings and due process jurisprudence that underlies our zoning, planning, landlord tenant, affordable housing, and environmental laws, those areas in which I practice. For the past 10 years, almost 10 years, uh, at Department of Housing and Community Development, I was able to develop systems for the Emergency Assistance Program, the only statewide family shelter system in the country. I developed policies and procedures to help homeless families and work with them to draft ADA accommodation plans and rehousing strategies that work. My understanding of Fifth Amendment takings jurisprudence regularly informs my efforts to preserve long-term affordability, subsidized housing through Chapter 42. In closing, over the course of my career, I've represented the varied constituencies of the housing board, tenants, small <coughs> landlords, large property owners, and government providers of affordable housing. I'm hoping that you will see my background and experience as well suited to continuing the proud traditions of the Massachusetts Housing Court, and that you will see fit to confirm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor uh, Hurley. Yes, uh, before you spoke, a while ago, uh, and uh, just to give you a background, In the housing court, uh, as a district court judge, uh, I did family planning. As a young lawyer, I was the city prosecutor for housing enforcement in the housing court. And uh, I vowed it for good <laughs> because some of the provisions. I have actually I had some experience when I was at the housing authority. Housing authority is in a different position from what we do. So everything's fact specific and applying the facts to the law. I wouldn't know exactly the circumstances until I would deal with them. Uh, but in in the case of reporting, we now have the ADA as a tool which would overlay any types of litigation situations based on the underlying law. And that would come into play to address certain equities and situations and making reasonable accommodations. Uh, you know, I have seen people ordered to clean up the property over a period of time, um, some assistance provided, some able to be provided. Um, then there's an eviction order uh, eventually issued. I've seen that happen. 
God has what you see. Asking, what will you do? It's not easy to say without knowing all the facts and all the circumstances of that particular situation. Okay, so here's the facts, here's the circumstances. Then Lord May brings an eviction action. The rooms are almost impassable. Um, they're on a third floor. There's danger of the weight of what's in there cause a um, calamitous um, falling <coughs> of all the materials uh, on the tenant below so that you have um, a threat to the structural, structural integrity of the Landlord comes in and says, I've tried to work on them. I can't. Don't listen to me. Hasn't gotten rid of anything. Keeps bringing more stuff. It's a danger to the other tenants. It's a danger to the, the structural integrity of the building. And yes, it pays his rent. But I can't have him stay here because it's become a threat to public health, safety, and welfare. What do you do? You're the judge. Well, in that case, there are housing specialists. That's one of the things that housing specialists and housing will do. They will be able to perform a site inspection and see whether that's real, you know, what the real seriousness of the case is. In a case like that, I would expect the municipal code enforcement to be all over and fully involved in that matter before it got to court in the first instance on an eviction. That's, uh, so you have to take your keys from from those circumstances, from the other inputs that are going on. That's, uh, that's and, and push comes to shove. If the situation is not addressed through these efforts, uh, ultimately you have to uh, evict the tenant on summary process if the landlord says that's the only way to remedy that situation. It's a clause. How long a period of time would you allow for these processes The, typically, those types of pro well, the, the housing specialist visit usually can be done in less than a week. In an urgent situation, as you're saying, this is health and safety. I would want to hear from the municipal enforcement agency. Is this truly an emergency? I would take my key. Uh, I would, were I to be granted that opportunity, from how seriously the municipality took that situation and granted appropriate urgency. If it was truly an emergency that needed to be addressed in a single day, then you know there there are ways to address it. Uh, it can take weeks to, uh, to have the possession forcibly removed by an outside agency in those circumstances. But the, uh, the situation if it's truly a health and safety emergency it needs to be addressed very, very quickly. The landlord says it's but that's a summary process. It's going to cost me ten thousand dollars to clean that place up. Would you award him damages to include possession and cost of removing all those materials? Uh, I think ultimately, if ADA issue at that point, the cost is an issue that's no longer an urgent. So you can really look into all the facts and circumstances, see what is required as a reasonable accommodation. Uh, and if that ADA law it really would affect this particular situation. Uh, and it would have to, you have to look and see, is this a small landlord for whom this would not be a reasonable accommodation, et cetera. Uh, but that's, that, those are the types of issues that I, I would look into. Ultimately, it goes to police. Language of the lease says the tenant bears the cost uh, of remediation of any cause issues. That's what the lease says. You apply the law to that. And what, what, what if there is no lease? If there is no lease, then it will be a tenancy at will. Tenancies at will have certain common law uh, 
implied by covenants. Um, and you know, uh, there's you go back to the old Commonwealth waste, um, ultimately, that's just in many cases. So, are you going to make this minimum or pay? It doesn't matter if they're big or small. Are you going to make the minimum or pay? Are you going to make a call? Or at least give an order for judgment? It, in all likelihood, in this case, a landlord's not going to be able to be made whole because the court is not going to have any assets except for the hoarded stock. No, but I didn't ask that. I asked if you were going to give him a judgment. If I had a dollar for every judgment that's uncollectible, right. I'd be a multi-millionaire. If, if the costs of cleanup are attributable purely to the tenancy and they're a, a good for bridging or from the lease or it meets the requirements of the, of the common law in a tendency of will, then that's what the damages that will be awarded. All right. Um, we have a case involving a landlord who comes in and uh, is trying to evict uh, two tenants who live in the same One tenant is saying, I paid my rent money to the other tenant, and I have been paying my rent money to the other tenant. So the non payment of the rent is my fault, and I don't have a place to stay. What do you do there? That's an unfortunate circumstance. The law is that if you've got joint tenants, both are responsible. Rent. The landlord needs rent money to pay the mortgage, to pay the taxes, to pay the upkeep and maintenance on the building. Uh, ultimately, you cannot keep the tenant there who is not paying the rent and is not able to pay that rent attributable to the contract that was entered into jointly. The fact is, in most circumstances, you'd say, talk to housing specialists. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if you can come up with some sort of plan. I'll eat some of it, you eat some of it, and we'll come to some sort of agreement. Those are those are cases are typically resolved, in my experience, in a way like that, rather than by you know, the ultimate sanction finally coming up. Uh, but the law is ultimately, if you have to do it, you apply the law to the facts. So basically, you're part social worker, part judge. Well, in the housing court, there's a strong role separation between the specialists and the judge. The judge doesn't work those settlements. All the judge can do is say, please talk to specialists. Right, but you're, you recognize that there's a human element to this kind of case that's different from the district court or the security court. <laughs> Yes, that's what I've been doing for the bulk of my career. And pro se's, I work myself with pro se's, trying to work out ADA accommodations to work for them, trying to work out repayment plans, trying to, in the EA case, trying to figure out ways to get them in house. Okay. Um, I just said, you be
They go after the landlord, even if it's the tenant's fault. You know? <laughs> so, so, so I, so I, I kind of don't buy that uh, part of it. That you know, it's co it's code enforcement would be involved or even well, code enforcement's going to order the landlord to get the place cleaned up, and the tenant's not allowing them access. So you could have a scenario where you got a young couple, um, barely getting by, you know, barely meet, meeting their mortgage payments. The audit to clean this place up doesn't have the ten thousand dollars it's going to cost, and um, and you're sitting there saying, well, you know, uh, it's a code enforcement issue. Let them deal with it first. But I think money can be earned. They may not have it, and you know, the tenant, some tenants, even if they're hoarders or whatever, might have the money. You know, just because they're renting doesn't mean they don't have money, right? And that's okay. I think so facts and circumstances. So, so when you said that you know it's no longer an emergency, it's about money now. I don't agree with that. Well, if I may clarify, then we're talking about equitable, short-term equitable action before summary process in the case of a hoarder who is causing potential serious damage to the property and health and safety concerns for the other tenants and, and himself. I think in that circumstance, uh, that's what I was talking about, so urgent that it required equitable action before the summary process could be completed. The money damage. What's the equitable action? What is it? It could be ordered to clean up the who property. Who are you ordering to clean up? The tenant? The other judge. Right. Very from the ground. Right. Let's, let's forget about case specialists. Let's forget about housing specialists, whatever you call them. Let's forget about uh, code enforcement. Right now, we're in front of you, the other judge. Okay, uh, for whatever reason, it might be, you know, usually a quarter has some type of mental health issues, obviously. Uh, but you're sitting there, and the landlord's sitting there, the young couple that just bought a place after getting married, working for a couple of years to get it. Uh, and, you're, and they said, they, they won't clean it up. There's nothing we can do. I, I get code enforcement ordering me to do it. I'm getting daily fines, okay? Um, the, uh, I'm not getting my rent for my other two tenants. I'm about to get foreclosed on, okay? What are you gonna do at that point? Well, the, the way I've experienced it, I've, I've seen it done. I, I think that this is the right approach. You first order to tenants through equitable action to clean it up. How much time do you give basis? You know, wait, I get the mortgage company sending me letters. It, How much time do you give It depends on the circumstances of the case. We, we get the circumstances. But, the place is a disaster. There's mice the, running around. Right. You can't get through the apartment. Right. Code right. enforcement's uh, finding the landlord for that. You have the circle. You have the facts. Right. So then, then you see, you order it to be done immediately. What's immediately? Immediately is... Is as, that 24 hours? Is that 48 hours? Is that a week? I think you got to allow somebody time to hire a contractor to do that kind of work. It's at the state that we're talking about. It takes a little time to get a contractor. So I think you want immediate reporting. First, order the tenant to do it because it's a tenant's responsibility. Right. So and how then, much time are you giving them to do it at, at the outset? I, I have seen people being required to report that in like 24, 48 hours. Okay, not what you've seen. What you've seen. Yeah, what you've seen. Well, I think what are you going to do? I think that that's an appropriate response. 24, 48 hours, come um, back with a plan. Come back with a plan. Okay, so I, 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 now 48 hours, they come back, they get the plan, they get a contractor. How much time do you give them to clean it up? The contractor has to say what, uh, what's reasonable. Yeah, to the partner. How long does it take to clean up all the crap? Um, I've, I've seen apartments that are only two bedrooms that take three weeks to clean them up. Okay. People going around so, the clock. Right, and so this is the we've already researched. Okay. It's three weeks. Yeah. All right. So you let them clean. You give them three weeks to clean it up. And there's a contract. Okay. Now, um, three weeks later, they come back. And the contract said, let me. The contract they, they, they wouldn't give up their, their, their order. They wouldn't let me in. What are you going to do then? Well, in that case, it should come back. The landlord should <coughs> come back right away as soon as the tenant wasn't allowing access. Well, you know, the landlord doesn't know that necessarily, okay? He, he, he knows that uh, you've audited it, cleaned up in three weeks, that there's a contractor there. Uh, there's not communication going on between the landlord and the tenant because they, they are, at this point, there's a lot of adversity because the tenant's being evicted, so they're not really talking. 
They just wait for the three weeks to be out. You know, they don't want to spend a fortune for a lawyer, okay? And he comes back in and says, Judge, I talked to the contract on the holiday home. The, the tenant won't let the contract in. Which is, not a, which is not uncommon. It, no, it's not uncommon, although in a circumstance like that, not not to drag it out for three weeks. Land, I would think the landlord would, would come back to court sooner, but... But it did, because it, it, it doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't know what's going on. Not right. The town won't talk. There's no stuff coming out. A hoarded place. Um, this is... Uh, at Boston Housing... You know what I'm looking for from it? No, what's the, the, the site? Right. I'm so not what I'm tell, we're telling you is we have the, there are access orders. You go, you go to court, okay. and, and so the now judge says access. there's no access. We, we order the tenant to provide access. At that point, there's an equitable order. Violations of the equitable order are contempt. And they can be treated like contempt. Okay. They find an old so you find any contempt when they come in on the third week? And they won't let the, uh, the uh, contract in? Again, that's a very fact-specific circumstance. Okay, so you have all the facts. But uh, I would think, in all likelihood, they're not coming in on a contempt complaint at that point. What they're more likely coming in on is the access order. You see what's going on here, though? Now we're into, we're at least a month out, probably probably three months without any rent coming in, four months before they before you. Now we get another month, and now we're going to go into another month. Now it's going to be four months where these people who own this one piece of property if the mortgage company comes down, nobody's paying rent. I understand. It's a difficult circumstance. If they want... Not difficult circumstances. They're going to get foreclosed on. That's the bottom line. If, if the landlord wants to do the cleanup on the landlord's dime and says, I know you can't do then it, I'm in. Well, then, they, <coughs> then the landlord can get the access order the next okay. day. Then you get back to the situation where the landlord has to pay to clean it up. And it's a $10,000 job. Okay. Are you going to immediately call the tenant to pay the ten thousand? They, they've got, they've got, a, they, they've got to come out with a hundred thousand dollars. We've established that. Are you know how to pay forthwith upon presentation of reasonable bills for the cleanup, assuming we know what it costs. You've already approved the contracting cost. It's already come up with. Uh, I think in those circumstances, the tenant ought, ought to pay. Or pay forthwith. That does make. How decisive of the judge even? Uh, as a judge, that's the judge's job, is to be decisive. I would try to be decisive. Because I'm not getting that from you. No. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't mean to criticize it. That in, in, you know, I don't know much about housing. I'm not, I don't own property. I owned property years ago. I don't now. And I'm not really involved in the housing program. But what I'm looking at is how decisive you are as a city. I'm not getting it. I, uh, I'm sorry, because it's hypotheticals, I just feel, you know, my, my lawyer background kicking in. I, I like to look at the exact so facts. When you're, on the bench, when you're on the bench, you're responsible for those facts that have come in front of you and make a decision based on the facts at the end. So, There's no question you fall. I don't mean, I'm not trying to get out of time. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get some decisiveness. You know, you've got a lot of background in the doing it forever, okay? You certainly have more experience in this area than anybody in this room can find, probably, with the exception of the judge. Um, so I'm not questioning the qualification. I just want to hear some. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not getting it. Well, uh, you know, as I said, ultimately, you get to a point of contempt, and contempt is pretty decisive. Yeah, it's pretty decisive. Then what are you just found contempt? What does that mean? Well, contempt means that fines and ultimately the possibility. Salary. Going in the lockup. Ultimately, that is a sanction. I, I have never seen imprisonment imposed in a contempt action in the housing. Okay. It's, it's not. It's it, happened to some landlords. We've heard about it. It has happened historically. In, in some landlords more than clean ups. I, I've seen it. But I've never seen it in, in a hoarding situation. Um, and I've seen a few when I was at the housing court. Uh, and I've, I've been in court observing. I'll keep that in mind should you be so gracious as to do so. Thank you. I don't have anything. Thank you. Anybody else?
outstanding educational background. He is very well qualified. I have the same frustration. I'm totally up front with you. The council of early had, the council of Kennedy had. I have no idea what you were doing that summer. Not, not, not even a clue. I mean, you're talking about big <laughs> landlords, small. What does even that mean? Big landlords, small. But make it in simple terms. And instead of saying the housing specialist, the code enforcement, you're the judge. You're not convincing people here. I'm trying to help you, by the way. You know, I'm trying to help you. So I hope you get the clue. I understand. There's eight of us here. There's, there's a very, I think that there's different expectations of a landlord. A landlord is a large landlord, it's a multifamily house, multifamily apartment. They have the assets to spread things over. Let's make it real simple. Small. Okay, I'm Lenny Sammy. Sammy, big landlord in Boston. He's one of the biggest. And then you got this uh, family that uh, owns six triple deckers. You have no clue. You have no clue <coughs> as the judge. Am I right or wrong? If Lenny Samia is mortgage to the hilt, it's got so much in debt. I mean, on paper, he's got you know two thousand units, but he, he could his assets could be less than this 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 uh, couple who owns three or four. Triple decades. You don't know. So when you say big, you took the number of units people have. You don't know. You know, are they mortgage to the hill? Do they have debts on other investments that they made and they're going under? How would you know that? You just talked about the that number. You don't know. Those, those are facts and circumstances that you wouldn't know. But what you you can figure is that any landlord that has a large number of units can expect there are going to be a certain number of problem tenants like this order that is going to be part of, just part of the cost of doing business. No matter how mortgage, that's the landlord's choice. And so I think you have to be a little bit more sensitive when you're dealing with small landlords who own, you know, a triple They They are in a very different circumstance and their expectations are different. But ultimately, you need to, as a judge, take all the facts and circumstances into account. The, Triple decker owner could also be a trust fund baby and have all every asset in the world. And the hoarder could be someone who is, you know, has has not can't, really can't do anything. Uh, what in that sort So what do you do? Go, you go through their assets. How do you determine that? Like how do you know that the owner of this triple decker is? They, they just inherited fifty million. How do you know that? In, in, in a reasonable accommodation analysis. All those facts and circumstances need to come. Well, how do they come out? I'm just curious because I don't do any of this work. <coughs> Financial statements for the landlord? You'd expect the landlord that has that kind of money to have an attorney, and the attorney would prepare all the materials. A but why would he want to say that he has 50 million? Well, that's not to his advantage. It may not be, but if that. Well, so, but does, but it, does, it, does it, that just question, that as the judge, you have to ask, like the landlord, what, how much? What are your assets? I don't know. I, that, that would be part of a reasonable accommodation analysis. So you would ask for someone's assets? If a breakdown of your financial situation. If it's a question of who can bear the immediate cost in those circumstances of a cleanup that absolutely needs to do, be done for health and safety, you got to, ultimately the tenant would be legally liable in those circumstances. And it does, but, the landlord, if it cannot be cleaned up, you will get the tenant. The tenant has no assets. The landlord has the legal responsibility for then cleaning up that unit, whether the tenant's there or not. So, so you, you know, if you need to do it on a short-term basis, then you have to get into knowing more about the background as opposed to the You can't just. Uh, I would not think that in a case like that, where you're dealing with mental illness, people who have all sorts of different asset classifications background then you can just say well there's a there's a black letter law that applies on that's that's because reasonable accommodation law under the ada it's a very complex very fat, very <coughs> specific thing and that's what i've been doing a lot of families that's what i've been doing so you're saying
I think it's uh, an issue you would have to determine on a fact basis, but I, my experience is that most people who I've seen in that position have not that close. So what are you trying to, I couldn't understand your answer. You're trying to make this Here's the order, in the department, you know, six, six units of apartment. Let's make it real easy. The hoarder, the money's not an issue for the hoarder. Okay? It's plenty of money. The landlord's got plenty of money. Uh, same hypothetical. Without saying here, we're going to call code. Assume we've done all that. How much? Is it fully making it this one? The hoarder, the hoarder's got plenty of money. He doesn't want to leave the apartment. No, I want all my stuff here. I can't. I'm going to freak out if I start paying. The hoarder gets an expert. So, you know, maybe the expert says, yeah, maybe you can wait on that uh, floor down there, you know, you know, whatever you want to say, 15,000, whatever. But if we remove 2,000 pounds, it's fine. I mean, do you get into it? What are you going to do with stuff like that? And what do you remove? I mean, because obviously, you don't have to remove all of it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a different issue. Ultimately, if the landlord wants to evict the tenant, it's a lease violation to afford as much stuff as the, the landlord can ultimately do. We're talking about how do you handle emergency situations. So in your well, case, saying, it's not an emergency. I, I'm alleging it's the landlord saying it's an emergency. Me, I, me as the tenant saying it's not an emergency because I can now get rid of one room of hoarding material, and I, I get this answer that it's not. And I'm paying my rent on time. I'm a good tenant. I don't put have loud music. I, I'm a good person, so I got a legitimate job. What are you doing those situations? Well, that's you got a battle of experts, right? Yeah. We're talking only about <coughs> emergency. I'm talking about this is not that was that one. I guess I know I'm not going to so. But are you talking about emergency equitable relief, or are you talking about the summary process? So you want I want to evict well, him. I want to get the saying it's emergency. And then their person has got a battle of experts. Right. How long does that take? Is that something that takes a decision in a week? Or I, I don't know the, how that works in housing. If you've got a, a battle of experts, you can see Because the landlord's saying it's emergency. I, I got to tell you, I've never experienced a hoarder who's got that kind of money to hire an expert to look into that issue. Really? Like the issue. So, whoa, 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 so if you're yeah. extre in my whatever extremely wealthy means in your in your in your definition, they can't be hoarders. No, there there can be. It's not my I have uh, uh, it's not my experience that I come out of the public housing. So my tenants that I've dealt with. No, but now you're gonna be dealing with one. Now you have some in downtown Boston, they're paying rent and seat for it, they're paying eight thousand. They're paying eight thousand, more than eight thousand a month, maybe up to fifteen thousand a month. So they're wealthy people, right. and they're a hoarder. If it's an emergency situation, it's alleged to be an emergency situation. Health and safety are at risk. Well, that's the hoarder who wants to hire an expert better hire an expert who can testify very quickly. Then it's the battle of the experts. What does the judge? Trust the code enforcement folks who are experts who will all likelihood say this place is going to fall down unless it's addressed immediately, or the expert hired by the uh, you know, by the tenant in that case. That's a battle of the experts. The judge may, would make a determination based on which expert presented isn't the that, better case. Isn't that really tough when the when the when the uh, board is going to say, hey, I've lived here five years. This place has been. This is impassable, every hallway, every bedroom, every living room. So, what are you talking about, miscellaneous? I mean, I don't even, that happens. You don't get what you, what is, yeah, over time it gets worse and worse, but we're sold out. There's nothing in the room. So, the, the real issue is that we're dealing with, as I understand it, is is this an emergency? And if it's an emergency, the judge has to order what's required. Consistent with the law for absolute health and safety needs. And that may require that the hoarder leave the space immediately and that the, the uh, location, this rich person, the person can stay in a hotel, and that the 